Thank you. Mr. O'Donnell. Good morning. Um, I'm going to confine my questions to people in the criminal justice pipeline. I'll start with people at the end. I'll get back to the ones we'll be getting in a minute. Okay. Um, as you know, two years ago, we passed a bill requiring mental health discharge planning. The governor was gracious enough to sign it on December 31st. Um, and including $20 million in last year's budget uh, to do that, including $7.8 million uh, for supportive housing. Is, is your mic on? Is, the mic is on now, yes. Uh, $7.8 million for supportive housing. So my first question for you is, um, have you spent the $20 million? And if you have, what have you done with it? Yes, well, we're, we're spending it. We spent most of it. Okay. So just so you know, there have been different pieces to the $20 million. One piece has been to establish in the prison system, um, that, so it's within the prison system, we are screening all um, individuals who have had any contact with um, the mental health system in prisons for the three years before. So we have implemented that, and that's ongoing. We have also set up three units in prisons, in different prisons, for um, working very closely with um, individuals who have been screened and assessed to have a high um, uh, propensity for violence. Um, that's in three different prisons. And we have also established in two prisons um, units for those individuals who are going to have difficulty transitioning into the community who also have a history of violence. And those two, I think one is at Sing Sing, I forget what the other one is. And they will be, prisoners will be in those units between nine and 12 months before being discharged from prison. So they will have the opportunity to really gain the skills needed. Then once in the community, we have set up um, an additional 150 uh, supported housing beds. And around those supported housing beds, we have wrapped, um, uh, these are again, high, high risk patients. We have wrapped ACT like services, not specifically ACT teams, but that's a sort of community treatment. These are teams that work with, uh, they have psychiatric backup, they have social work backup. And those teams work with those individuals t for up to a year to a year and a half, depending on the need, ensuring that they have a successful transition into the community. And there's also work with the parole system for those individuals. Many of these individuals are on parole. So those teams then work with the parole individuals to wrap these services around. So the $20 million is being spent on community-based services. It's being spent on in, in house services. There's another piece of the dollars which have um, been spent on the individuals from prison who leave to come to the state psychiatric centers. Um, those individuals, um, we have set up a special unit in the state psychiatric system to work with them, um, be partly because um, <coughs> that group of individuals, and this training is for the prison system as well as our state psych centers, in addition to their mental illness, have what we call criminogenic issues, um, and staff have to be up for dealing with that. And there are evidence-based practices that work, so we've done an extensive training. So that is also ongoing. And then there's one more piece, which is a transitional living unit for individuals which will be staffed by OMH, for individuals who maybe can't move directly into community apartments, but may need a transitional living with OMH staff. So we are spending the money. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, you have proposed uh, reduction of beds or any of the reduction of beds at the Central New York Psychiatric Center, which is the one that is used by the prison system? No. Okay. No. Um, I'd like to move back to the 730 exam process. I took me a long time to read this, the mental capacity restoration. I've never heard that word before. Um, uh, so you understand I was a full-time public defender from 1987 to 1995. I'm very well versed on how that process works. Um, in 2012, we amended the law to allow individuals to be released and have the 730 exam while not incarcerated. Um, my information is that in the last three years, only three people have been provided with that opportunity. Do you have any explanation for why that is? You know, I, quite frankly, I have to check. I do know that um, we have been um, looking to have, I think what you're talking about is community-based restoration. Right. The, so they're not um, in and, a, a facility um, we, at the time. Uh, um, I, I, one of the issues with that, but I'm not saying it's the whole issue by any means, is the um, ability of the, uh, the district attorneys in the various areas, because we have started to talk to them about um, doing this, and we get a fair amount of um, pushback. I think they have a high degree of concern about doing um, ambulatory restoration. Right. I believe there are a few places in the state um, where they've started to do it, but it's very small. Other states do this a lot. We yes, do they do. Them. So the DAs are the impediment to saving the money for the localities 
to not require to them to extent, be yes. patient. My yes. last question about the 730 exams. Um, I'm very concerned about your proposal uh, to do these in jails. Um, hospitals allegedly are therapeutic environments. Jails and prisons are never therapeutic environments. The vast majority of the people who were mentally ill enough to warrant a 730 exam in the New York City criminal justice system are clearly people who need to be in a therapeutic environment and not in a jail environment. And so as much as I understand your need for savings, I think that uh, Mr. Aubrey and Ms. Savino both raise very important points. The people in the jails are not sufficiently trained to deal with people with these kind of severe mental illnesses. And, um, you know, I would ask you to seriously reconsider whether or not that's the right way to deal with it. What has happened in my years, I've been told it was four years now, Jeff, four years as corrections chair, are prisons have become the mental institutions of the 1960s. And we're not yet up to speed with getting both services and an acknowledgement that we need to change those environments because of the nature of who they are. The people who get 730 are the creme de la creme of the mentally ill. And they really do not and should not be held uh, in non-therapeutic environments while they're trying to see if they could be made healthy enough to even just stand trial. Yeah, I, I understand your concerns. I think if we, are, if we do go forward with trying this in a few counties, um, we would clearly, these would have to be separate units. So again, a county may not want to do this. It would have to be separate units in jails. There would have to be um, the clinical support. And we would have to also pick and choose who would get these services, because obviously some would absolutely still have to come to um, mental hospitals. I mean, there's no question about that. It's whether, um, if we were to look at this almost as um, with a couple of counties, whether there were some individuals who could be safely and appropriately treated with the necessary clinical supports in a jail, in a separate unit in a jail. And that's something that I think you know, we might explore. But I, I agree with you. It has to be done carefully, and we have to be sure that individuals who need to be in hospitals get to hospital competency restoration. Right, but there's very little experience where creating a separate unit actually changes the environment for the environment of incarceration to, to one that is actually d designed and working to be therapeutic. If that's going to happen, good luck to you. It's never happened yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Terrence Murphy. Thank you, Senator Young. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here this morning. I'll try and be as brief as I can. In the O'Toole settlement, uh, supposedly we're supposed to have uh, 4,200 uh, residents moved by 2018. Uh, approximately how many have been moved so far? Um, 207 have been moved from adult homes into housing. 1,300 have expressed, an, of the 3,000 screened, 1,300 have it currently expressed um, an interest in moving. So 1,300 we are working with, 3,000 have been screened, and 207 have moved. So 3,000 have been screened? Screened, and they, they've been approached. They've been approached and said, are you interested, sorry, they've been approached and said, are you interested in leaving? And on first approach of those 3,000, um, 1,300 have said, yes, we are interested in leaving. <coughs> Um, adult homes and we're in the process of working with them to move them from the adult home. It ultimately is the individual's choice. I mean, we, we try to encourage them to want to do it, but some do have decided that they haven't wanted to go. So we're working with a pool of 1,300. It might be a little bit bigger when the um, outreach is done to the full 4,000. Thank you. And in, in 2013, you have approximately 84 million that has been appropriated here. In 2013 and 14, the appropriation was 16.8 million. In 2014 and 15, the, approach, the appropriation was 30 million, and this year it was 38, 38 million. How much of that money in uh, 13 and 14 out of the 16.8 has that been spent? I'd have to get you those numbers in terms of the, of the dollars. I mean, there's, there's money spent 
that um, are obviously on the assessments, on um, the working and the planning, there's been contracts let, but I don't know the exact amount that it's had, and I'd, I'll have to get back to you on that. No problem, no problem. The second question here, in the executive's article in se Article 7 Bill in Part K, dealing with the uh, jail-based restoration, little concern I have is what the potential costs are going to be to our counties. Do we have any idea of what that is going to entail and how we're going to get there? Or the, um, the reason that some of the counties might be interested in is because currently the jail-based restoration is done in our psychiatric facilities and the cost for the average jail-based restoration is over about one hundred and thirty dollars to $140,000. So the, the um, per jail-based restoration, it's expensive. So the counties um, pay half of that at the current time. So they are paying about $70,000. Um, the counties are, the few counties that have expressed interest are interested because the projections, again, doing, if we do it right with clinical assistance and a separate unit, et cetera, would be about forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000. So it would actually save money to the counties, and that's why there's some interest in doing it. So it's actually the counties who have an interest. Um, if they're not interested, we won't do it. This is totally voluntary, and um, it would have to be a county that was really, um, had a desire to do it, and would want to do it in a way, um, as was mentioned before, that is clinically appropriate for would, uh, these individuals. Would, would there be any reimbursement to the county for that 40, 000, roughly 40000 No, there isn't no. now. No, there wouldn't be. No. Okay. And last question. I know uh, Senator Savino had brought this up, uh, the, uh, rate in, the rate increase in SSI. I know you, DOH, but it is um, terribly important that that, be, that gets addressed because we have got uh, to take care of these people that can't take care of themselves. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Here. Over Sorry. here. <laughs> Um, I, I want to follow up on uh, what Assemblyman Crouch raised about schools and youth, and I'm wondering why there's no money in the budget to address that, because I too am hearing that the increase in, in special needs, and I use that really broadly, is a huge issue in schools dealing with everything from ADHD to more extreme disorders, and I also want to, you know, sort of frame this as a not just mental but emotional health, which I think is under your purview too, and doesn't seem to get included um, in the conversations. And the schools are dealing with this, or they're seeing just enormous increases, and how, as, as the commissioner of this agency in the state of New York, what's your agenda for helping the school districts and helping the communities and helping our kids? I think that there, there are two, there are different ways to work with the schools. One way is clearly through um, school-based actually services, and that they are, there's no new money for that in the um, current budget. But what is new money in the current budget is through the reinvestment. And all, when I speak of crisis intervention teams for children across the state, that we have been investing in those crisis intervention teams work very closely with the schools. So they are there to uh, respond to concerns the schools may have about an individual. In fact, a good percentage of the work that some of our crisis teams teams do is almost half of the work is with the schools. So the crisis intervention teams that we've been putting up are effective also help for the schools. The other that we do have is um, educational um, outreach and work that we do with the schools um, in terms of training to see signs of like su suicide prevention, mental health first aid kind of training that we do out there with the schools at their request and we uh, do a lot of that training across the state, that's embedded in the budget. So um, we also have these school promise zones, that's paid for out of the budget. There's no new dollars, I have to be honest, in this budget, but there's, except for the reinvestment, the reinvestment dollars are new. The second piece is that the, um, Additional money for Medicaid, which is coming, um, that $30 million investment does provide uh, the kinds of services that will be in-home based and the kinds of services that could also go to a school for an individual in need. So that $30 million, while not appropriated specifically to schools, will be serving um, and helping the crisis, um, crisis teams for schools, will be helping um, do on-site work with kids in schools, that kind of work. So that is embedded in the Medicaid dollars that are coming down the pike. So there is an expansion there. And how many school districts, how many schools, or do you feel like this is, because it doesn't seem like a lot of money for the number of schools we have across the state. Well, it, it doesn't touch as many schools as it would need to, no, it doesn't. Is this a priority of yours going forward to, to enhance? Because it, it seems like this is, you know, this is the, the opportunity to 
you know, to, to cut off future needs and future costs by addressing these issues early with our, yeah. our um, young people. No, I agree. And I think with the Medicaid, the dollars that are going now into Medicaid and into the, um, the plans that we have, it's an opportunity to invest and to go forward and to do more work in the schools as we go forward. Absolutely. And I would Absolutely. encourage that. Um, my uh, second question is, is about the Hudson Correctional Facility, which is in my assembly district, and what your plans are for the mental health services among that in, that, in its new configuration, and also would encourage you, obviously, to reach out to the local community um, in hiring and, and training as well. Yeah, we are still um, looking at the entire picture of forensics across the state, so there's no firm plan yet for the... Um, um, Mid Hudson Correctional Facility. Um, it is an old facility. This is the Hudson. No, I'm talking Hudson, about the, I'm sorry, the Hudson, Hudson that, that's going to be, you yes. know, that's part of the Raise the Age program. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, we will be, we'll be looking. What's, yeah, what is your timetable for, have, and will you be having mental health facilities and programs and, and staff in that facility? Um, I have to get back to you on that, actually. I'm not sure about the timetable for when. What you, are you involved in this in I'm the plans for this? Which this is the this is in, in the city of that's the Hudson facility, Hudson Correctional Facility that's going to be the, the you know the youth facility. Um, that's that's oh the, I'm sorry the raise I'm sorry I was I wasn't connecting my dots for a minute. That's the raise the age that's for the right. youth who will be coming. Yes, exactly. we are involved, and actually there's a million dollars in the budget to support the um, uh, mental health services that will be there for those hundred, it's about a hundred youth that will be coming to that facility to get specialized um, uh, services in general and also mental health. So it's about, we will have mental health services there for that youth. About a million dollars is in the budget to, to supply that, yes. And do you have a timetable for that yet? Do you know what I'm, the... I think it's going to happen this year. It's going to happen very quickly, uh -huh. yes. And in the, the million dollars, what, how does that break down in terms of actual staff and programming? It's going to be mostly um, out, outpatient program. It's not going to be an inpatient, you know, obviously 100 staff, but it will, we will be having probably about um, several, probably about 15 staff. We'll be doing day programming, clinic hike services, pretty much what you would do for an outpatient population for youth, and we'll be doing that on site in the facility. We'll have the staff there. I see. Okay. And they were specially trained to work with the youth. Thank you. Yes. My time's up, but thanks thank very you. much. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Our next speaker is Senator Fred Akshar. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yeah, one more person. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, let me ask you just a, very, a couple very brief questions. Uh, there's an increase of $2.6 million for the expansion of your sex offender management program, an increase of 25 beds. Uh, are they community-based beds, and where are they going? No, those are, um, that's in the inpatient facility. Those, for, those beds are an increase for the individuals who are committed um, to the facility at, at the time of their release from prison. So those are inpatient beds expanded in the prison. In the um, SOMTA program, sorry, the sexual offender treatment program. Thank you. I just want to uh, follow up to my colleague, Assemblyman Crouch, about the Greater Binghamton Health Center, which is in the district that I represent, as you well know. Uh, it, are there any long-term plans specifically to close that um, health center? No. No, not at this time, no. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator. Assemblywoman Malia Takas. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I just had a couple Close of follow-up. on our side. I just had a couple of follow-up questions. Um, the justification for closing beds, you said that there was no wait list. Um, I just wanted to know how many people are currently on the wait list and what is the process to get on the wait list? Uh, a, wait, a waiting list is just a way to monitor whether individuals um, are, have been accepted to our facilities but are not um, admitted within like a two week period of time. If that's not happening, then we consider that we can't close that bed because obviously there are individuals who aren't moving fast enough into our system. So we do not close a bed if there are individuals who are waiting any longer than two weeks for a bed at a facility. But do you have an actual wait list? 
No, we don't really call it. You it, wouldn't no, have no. a wait list, right? Because it's mostly. A, a yeah, most, but the vast majority of individuals come in within a, it. It takes a certain amount of paperwork time, are transferred from hospitals within two weeks. So we don't actually have a, a wait list, but we monitor. So before we close the bed, we say, is there anyone on this list who hasn't gotten in? And we look. And if they have, there's anybody who's taking three weeks or four weeks or longer to get in, then we wait. We don't close So you the monitor bed. the occupancy rates Absolutely. also at that particular uh, Point site. In time. And then you Absolutely. see if people are being turned away. Or um, hel just held up. They're not just turned away. They so might in the be areas delayed. where you're seeing that people are held up, are you going to add then beds to those particular sites? Like maybe close in certain site, uh, close beds in certain sites, but then open. If we need to, we will. But often it's um, a very temporary blip um, that happens um, sometimes because of sometimes you know a unit temporarily, perhaps for a little construction work is a little bit down. So we haven't found yet that we've had to open up new beds. We've worked with the facilities and been able to work down any problem like that. But yes, we would if we had to. Okay, I just wanted to get clar clarity on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think Senator Boyle. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Commissioner, for okay. your testimony. Uh, just a quick question. As you know, I and my fellow Long Island uh, legislators have been very concerned about Children's uh, Psychiatric Center at Sagamore. And um, we're happy that the budget S continues for the 54 beds. S concerned, however, about the reduction of the number of units from four to three, and most importantly, the staffing levels. Uh, we hear reports uh, on a fairly regular basis that because of the lower staffing levels, there's being staff being put at, at risk. There's been injuries already reported about instead of having two staff in the room, in the classroom, for example, uh, there's only one. And uh, there's been some injuries, and we're very concerned about that. And we'd like you and your staff to look into that if possible. Yeah, we will. I mean, we, we monitor staffing very carefully, so we, we will look into any, um, any complaints. And also, we um, are still looking very, very hard to try to find child psychiatrists, so I know that that's a, it's an ongoing issue, ongoing issue. Yes, Senator. Okay, Senator Marchion. Thank you. C Commissioner, um, relative to the Hudson Correctional Facility, which is in my Senate district, just a follow-up question. Did you say that the staff is going to be part-time and not work out of the facility? Can no, you they will be working in the facility. Did you say they would be part-time? No, no. Okay. No. Okay. No, no, not part-time. No, they will, it will be, um, they will be providing the equivalent of outpatient services. We're not putting, um, so that we will have the staff full-time in the facility. Yes. Okay. Because yes. I was under the impression from the budget that it was required yes. that you were going to be putting full-time yes. staff. Yes. And yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I said in, that. Maybe it's in there. <laughs> no, no. Full time. Full time. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. 